aren't you glad that God is a great God? He is so awesome. <laughs> Boy, is he good. What a good father we have. And uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about uh, a Father's Day sermon today, but I, I, I just feel like I'm supposed to continue with my, uh, my sermon series in the book of 2 Corinthians. So um, let's just quickly pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that uh, there's just so many rich things in your word for us to, uh, to absorb. And uh, today is, is a day where we're just going to be turning to that book of 2 Corinthians again in chapter 7, God. And I just pray, Father, that as we go through this particular passage, God, that yeah, what you desire to accomplish inside of us would be done and, and that you'd help me to articulate it clearly in the way that would be honoring to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Got a bit of a breeze here, so if you see me scrambling for my paper, that's what's happening. Oh, okay. So, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, chap chapter 7, verses 2 to 16. So, that's the focus of, of our, uh, our sermon today. And um, the title of it is How to Repent. So, um, when we look at this uh, passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul uh, finished uh, speaking to the believers in Corinth about ensuring that they do not form major life partnerships with uh, people who are not believers as it was apparent in Corinth that this was happening and the issue needed to be addressed properly. But now Paul uh, moves to the next stage of this issue and um, if people have done wrong, if they've been taking bad advice instead of advice from God's representatives, then um, repentance would be the necessary step uh, for them to follow. Now, we all know this, and uh, our lives are imperfect, and we're imperfect people, and we're working through uh, issues that uh, we have in our lives. I don't think there's a person out, out there that doesn't have some kind of baggage from things that have happened in their lives. Uh, our sinful world impacts us and sometimes impacts us deeply. And with so much imperfection and sin out there, um, every one of us is susceptible at times to being led astray and uh, making bad decisions as a result of that. And in short, uh, everybody, really, all of us need to recognize the times where we're, uh, we're failing, where we have imperfections and deal with issues inside of us. Now, in particular, uh, when, when we interact with others, when we hurt someone else or when we ourselves are hurt by our own actions, um, whenever we break a law, whenever we tell a lie or steal or act inappropriately towards another person, gossip, make selfish serving, self-serving decisions um, at someone else's expense, God calls us to repent. And uh, this passage of scripture here is kind of the culmination of some stuff that was happening in the Corinthian church. And um, God calls us to repentance because when we make mistakes or when we make bad decisions, sometimes it's a willful choice. Um, without a change of mind, a change of attitude, um, it actually poisons us and renders our, our ability to, uh, to do the mission that God's called us to ineffective. And God, God wants to, to, uh, to work through those things in our lives um, when things that have been done to us, wrong things have been done to us or others uh, in our churches or families. Um, our whole family unit is disrupted and uh, sometimes those disruptions we, we need to we need to iron things out and uh, come to a resolution and stuff and um, that's important for our effectiveness as a family you know for a family unit um, and you see the the world out there that's not following the Lord and the dysfunction that is so apparent in the family unit as Christians because we live in this world sometimes there's residual things and and we need to recognize some things fathers you know I, I wish I was a perfect father but I know I'm not and I've made mistakes and and sometimes you know I, I need to say sorry to my children for not um, 
doing the right things. Um, but it, you know, my my sin, your sin, affects the family. It also affects the church and the collective uh, mission of the the church, the family and the church. So today's teaching in Second Corinthians seven, beginning with verse two, is a terrific lesson on how to bring about repentance in the various spectrums of our life properly. And uh, in this particular example, we are looking at how Paul addressed an issue in the Corinthian church that needed to be dealt with in order to bring about healing and restoration so that the church could go forward in strength in the way that God desired them to go forward in. So Paul begins his uh, message to the Corinthians in chapter 7, starting with verses 2 and 3. So he says this, he says, Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one, we have corrupted no one, we have exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you, I have said this before, that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die for you. So Paul begins the, the main theme of this chapter by returning to his plea with the Corinthians to make room in their hearts for him and for his co-workers in the gospel. And he's writing them to encourage them, not to condemn them. How could he condemn those who were, in, who were in his heart and were such a vital part of the fabric of, of his own life? Now, some of the Corinthian believers, and this is the context leading up to chapter 7, some of the Corinthian believers um, had been stirring and uh, they had been, they'd been believing many bad things about Paul, which in fact were false. Um, and the, the rumors were rife in the church, and Paul had to address this, right? Uh, and some of the rumors were that, that God was not using him, that he didn't have the kind of image, authority, or power that an apostle should have. Now, there were murmurings and issues that came out of this, but Paul affirms to the Corinthians here, he, sa he says that they are innocent of those kind of, of uh, gossip-laden charges against them, which suggested that they somehow were conducting their ministry to the Corinthians in a wrong, corrupted, or an exploitative way. Now, Paul is uh, not is very quick to say that this isn't only the case but he reminds them that um, as he has done before saying that he has love for them and that he is ready both to live with them or to die with them whatever the case might be now Paul tells them that he is committed to standing with them through the thick and through the thin that's essentially what he's saying here I'm committed to you guys I'm committed to stand with you through the thick and the thin so he continues in verse 4 saying I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all of our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. For when he, we came into Macedonia, we had no rest, but we are harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside and fears within. So Paul, Paul admits to speaking to the believers that were receiving this letter with great frankness. What he is saying here, he has spoken to them with truth in love. And when we consider the things that we have to go through in our, in our daily living, it's really assuring when we look at the scripture to see that Paul the Apostle of Jesus to the Gentile world, this great man of faith, also knew the meaning of distress and disappointment in his life. And, and sometimes when we face troubles, we, we feel alone. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when we face significant trouble in our life, we feel all alone and we feel misunderstood. And, and that other Christians, particularly the leaders we look up to, have come to some mastery in the faith, maybe a, of skating above the, the trials and the tests of life. And, as a result, we can often feel marginalized, marginalized, alone, and misunderstood. But it's important to see the truth in this matter that we're not walking alone. Not only is the Lord with us and walking with us through the difficulties, but there's a host of other believers. All other believers that are out there have to face uh, a diversity of um, difficulties. Even the apostles 
went through difficult times as they lived and taught these first Christian believers. When Paul went to Macedonia at the call of God, okay, remember that time when he was called to Macedonia? He was not called to a life of ease. Paul was called into a battle zone where he had to wrestle through things. He also wrestled with his own fears on the inside. Now Paul tells the Corinthians that faced outward conflicts as people who were influenced by the enemy tried to resist the establishment of the gospel in the area that he was sent into. He faced outright harassment from some as he was trying to work for the Lord. And he admits that there were times that he and his co-workers had no rest. I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? It feels like we're pressed hard from the outside. And uh, that there is a great resistance to what we are trying to accomplish in the kingdom of God. And sometimes we misinterpret these resistances as though maybe we're doing something wrong. But in fact, it's quite the opposite. When we face resistance sometimes, it's because we're doing something right, not because we're doing something wrong, because there is a battle that's going on, and the enemy wants to see the gospel of Christ shut down and things to be nullified and for our, our testimony to be disrupted. That's what he desires. But aren't you great? Or aren't you glad that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world? Aren't you glad for that today? We have an advocate that understands everything we go through. When we decide that we want to follow Jesus and we go where he calls us, our expectations, particularly in this culture of, com of comfort, okay, our expectations are that it might be an easy road to follow. But that's not the reality. Now, think about this. It was God's decision for Paul to be called into Macedonia. It was Paul, God's decision to allow for the trouble in the Corinthian church to boil over and to affect Paul. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't his decision. But, but consider call, uh, the call that Paul had to Macedonia. In Acts chapter 16, 9 and 10, we, we read briefly how Paul came to go to Macedonia. Actually, Paul was wanting to go to another place. He wanted to go to another city because he felt as though that was where the fertile ground was and that's what his plans were. He was going to go to another place. But God had a different plan. As a matter of fact, God, in the middle of the night, had a vision for Paul of a man in Macedonia. Chapter 16, 9 and 10 reads, During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and pleading with him. Come over to Macedonia and help us. As soon as Paul had seen the vision, we got ready to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So here we are after the fact. Okay, Paul obeyed this, this vision that he had. He obeyed it, and he went where God had instructed him to go. But now here's Paul in Macedonia, and what he's saying is that they faced harassment at every turn. Have you ever heard the call of God to go somewhere in life, to be a part of something, and when you arrived found that it was not a dance in the park? Have you ever found that? When, you, when you're there, being a human, somehow we can think that we're in the wrong place because of the harassment that it seems is on all sides. Maybe I got it wrong, we start to doubt ourselves. Maybe I didn't hear God right. We get discouraged and begin to doubt our calling to our own personal Macedonia. This is where we begin to wrestle with our inward fears and insecurities. It, it can happen. It can happen with any venture or journey that God calls us to take. This is not just something that happens to apostles. This is something to ha that happens with everyday believers. The truth of the matter is that we are called and sometimes we're called to a place of harassment, both from the outside and from within ourselves. But the truth of the matter is this, that God sees this. In His sovereignty, He sees the end from the beginning, and He sees the victory in the end that we're going to have over our enemy. But in the process, there is conflict. There is going to be a battle. You know, each of us... <sighs> 
We struggle inside sometimes, don't we? Although we have this new nature, this born again nature in the spirit, we still wrestle with the old sin nature and its insecurities and fears that we have to contend with. I often thought some, when, I, when I'm dealing with some kind of issue that uh, this shouldn't bother me. I, I should just be giving this over to the Lord. And in fact, I find myself waking up in the middle of the night and staring at the ceiling and struggling with angst, with anxiety. And, and I'm like, and I stare at the ceiling and I'm like, God, this isn't, this isn't right. In my flesh, I'm feeling anxious and I don't know what to do and I have no idea where to turn. I don't know where to go because I don't, I don't know what to do. And the Lord's like, so what are you going to do about it? Are you going to carry this, my son? Are you going to carry this on your own shoulders? Because if you do, you're going you're gonna to find yourself in a bad place. And then, you know, we struggle. And then the Lord's like, okay, what are you going to do about it? And I'm like, God, help me. Help me. My flesh is weak. I can't turn my eyes away from this. But I know that your Holy Spirit is calling me to turn my eyes towards you and to let it go. And he's like, yeah, that's what I'm calling you to, my son. Treat hardship as discipline. Treat hardship as discipline. All of us go through this. It's not easy to do what's right, to hold on to what is right. The truth that when God calls us, which he does, we are his servants just as Paul the Apostle was his servant. We, call, we answer the call to, of the Lord to go to these personal Macedonias because each of us has a mission from God that he's called us to. And sometimes he calls us to this Macedonia to establish the work of God there, whether it's at work, whether it's in a relationship that we're in, or a church, or another mission field. Sometimes we find ourselves involved in a relationship. Maybe our spouse is going through a really hard time. And we're like, God, I, I, I didn't think I had to go through this. It's not easy to work through. And maybe I'm the spouse that's troubled and God's trying to stir something to cause me to be refined. This is not easy. Sometimes it feels an awful lot like harassment. Indeed it is. But harassment is not necessarily outside of the will of God. This is where we get it wrong. Harassment sometimes is a catalyst to cause us to fall on our face before God and cry out to Him and say, I can't, Lord, and I need you. I need you this hour. I need you. Every hour, I need you. You know, in the family, it can be like this. In churches, it can be like this just because, you know, we're called to a certain church. Sometimes it gets tough. Sometimes a church can be not a nice place to go when you're wrestling with stuff, right? Because everyone else is wrestling with stuff too. So you got all these people wrestling with stuff and God's working something through. He's working something through and he wants us to keep our eyes on him. And you know, all this to say our enemy takes notice, but when we when we when we obey the Lord to go into that Macedonia, because God sees the Macedonian men and women and children, he sees them crying out silently for something more in life. Crying out, saying, There must be more to life than this. And you are called to that Macedonia because God has saw fit to place you there in that difficult circumstance because he's working something through. He wants you to bear witness for the testimony of Jesus and how Jesus Christ gives us the strength to do our lives. How we can't do it on our own. And how better when we're on our face before God and we realize that we really can't. Sometimes I think we, we feel like we got to be, the, you know, we're going to be this rock star, you know, Christian. Always on top of it, never feeling harassment, just cloud dancing. That's not scriptural. Paul, read this scripture. This is what Paul is saying he had faced. Hardship. The scripture that Paul is writing is written 
to bring us encouragement. And I know on the onset, when we're looking at this, this is kind of the, this is the crux of what he's trying to say. This, he's trying to say, listen, Macedonia is not a nice place. Corinth can be frustrating and, and it, it can be an, a, a place that's not really that nice. But he calls us to the life that we're living, knowing full well the circumstances that we'll have to endure in a battle. Put on the full armor of God, that when the day of evil comes. You see, God allows sometimes the enemy, he allows the enemy to harass us. Why? Because it drives us to our knees and causes us to be humble before the face of God. And that's where our victory is. It's not in the strength of the arm of man, but in the power of the Spirit. And God will allow us to be winnowed and sifted to the point where we're broken before Him so that He can actually work inside of us and through us. And so that it's not something that shows that we are in control, but it shows that He is in control and He's in the business of changing the hearts of a sinful, broken man and bringing us new life. The Apostle Peter agrees with Paul in 1 Peter 4, 12 um, to 19, where he says, Dear friends, do you not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you? But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Jesus, or Christ, you are blessed, for the Spirit of glory in God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you do suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name for time, for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to, listen to this, so then who, those who suffer according to God's will. God doesn't will that I suffer. Haven't you heard that message out there? God, will, God wills that I walk over top of all this stuff. No, it says here. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do what is good. Now the naysayers will say, if we follow God, we will have comfort and prosperity everywhere we put our feet. We can lay claim to it. These are like the Corinthians who were looking down upon Paul because Paul was going through it. Not considering his outward appearances and circumstances to be worthy of being an apostle of Christ. And this issue, this, this same issue steeps into the church throughout the ages. And it's the very issue that causes trouble and division in the Corinthian church. But when God calls us to something great for his kingdom... It's important for us to understand that that suffering and struggle that we encounter is not out of His will. It's not out of His will. Consider Jesus in His mission as a Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane. Consider that. What did He say? Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from, my, from me. But nevertheless, Thy will be done. So He submits to the will of the Father even though he knows and he can first see the suffering that's to come. Uh, I'm not, this isn't to be downcast, folks, because in the end of all of this, God refines us and he does something good in us and he builds us up. But in the time when we're built up, sometimes our sinful nature needs to be beaten down. It needs to be broken. Our hearts need to be shattered because our attitudes, our actions, our motives for doing things need to be rearranged. Well, anyways, I pray that we'll have the same posture as both Jesus and Paul when approaching our calling to our own personal Macedonians. Paul's great faith didn't take away the troubles he had to face, nor did he shy away from the mission because he knew that trouble would accompany it. Paul's faith gave him strength to endure through them, and the Holy Spirit lived in him and gave him joy in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his tribulations, in the midst of the hardship. The Spirit gave him joy. Paul continues to speak to the Corinthians in verse 16, or verse 6, saying, But God, I like this verse. This is such a great verse. When you're going through it, this is an awesome verse. But God who comforts the downcast, 
God comforts the downcast. Comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Wow, one of the names of the Holy Spirit, one of the names that, that describes the Holy Spirit is that of, of him being the comforter. You see, the nature of God is compassionate. And even when we have to face troubles, his comfort is always with his children. Now, Paul was downcast in spirit. There was likely, uh, he was likely wondering whether the church that he was planting in Ephesus would last. And he's waiting to hear word from Corinth because he had to write uh, a very hard letter to the Corinthians. And uh, that was hard on him. He was likely wondering if his words to them had been too harsh. Did I do the right thing, God? Uh, he's probably strength, uh, wrestling through this. But the God of all comfort, who knows what we need before we even pray, meets us where we are, and he commissions other people, in the case here, Titus, as servants to provide encouragement to us. Sometimes God sends a Titus to us in the midst of our distress, in, in the midst of our circumstances, in the midst of the hard times that we're going through, to provide encouragement exactly at the time where we need comfort the most. Isn't God good? He's good that way. He always meets us where we are and exactly what we need. We can trust him because he's trustworthy and he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's with us to the very end of the age. As an example, this past week, um, I, I was kind of feeling down. I had, I had some, some stuff going on and I, I was kind of feeling down. As a matter of fact, a little bit depressed. And God, God used somebody in this church. I'm not going to bring up names because it's, I know they'd never want me to say anything. But um, God used someone in this church to encourage me greatly on my journey. And that person had no idea what I needed. But God did. God sent someone to encourage me. And to this person... You know who you are. I want to thank you for your, very, your kindness. Because you obeyed the Lord, you encouraged me so much. I was so encouraged. But maybe you've had someone encourage you too. Maybe this week. Maybe you can remember when there was a time where you just needed to be boosted. And you needed some encouragement. You see, God uses others to comfort the downcast. And maybe there's times when God calls you to encourage another person just as you had received encouragement. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate to do good to someone when God puts them in your heart. When the Holy Spirit drops someone into your heart and, 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 and you can't get them out of your mind, He's doing that for you to pray for them, but maybe He's calling you to actively do something. Maybe, maybe you need to call that person or, or meet with that person and just encourage them. There could be something like that happening. Um, Titus encouraged Paul, but, but Titus wasn't acting independently and doing this either. But you see, uh, Titus, even though he was encouraging Paul, um, he had also received comfort from others in the Corinthian church leading up to that comfort he gave to Paul. So how did this happen? Well, um, Paul says, he, he says it here, okay? Verse 8. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leads no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What eagerness, what, er, uh, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourself to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the injured party, but rather before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. You see, 
there was a great misunderstanding in the Corinthian church between Paul and the Corinthian church. As a backdrop to this passage, um, in 2 Corinthians 2, if you look back in your Bibles to that point, okay, I won't get you to turn to there because I'm not going to read it, but on your own time, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, we see that there was a maligning of Paul's character by a false teacher that had come to the Corinthians and had spread false information about him, calling his leadership into question and the foundational message that he was bringing to them uh, into question and, and God had instructed Paul to do this but um, it was being brought into question and it created so much trouble it created so much trouble in the church that Paul had to make a short and very painful visit to Corinth from Ephesus to address this and after this visit Paul ended up giving the Corinthians a severe letter of rebuke maybe it was these letters maybe it's a letter that's lost that's not part of the scriptures but they gave a, he gave a fairly severe letter of rebuke to Titus to deliver to the Corinthians, and then he waited. Not sure how they would respond. They had either sided with the man among them in the church who was maligning Paul, or they simply had not responded to this man's opposition who, who, who represented Christ, but nevertheless, he had to give this letter, this harsh letter. And Paul had corrected them and instructed them to discipline this man. The dialogue for this is 2 Corinthians 2, 3 to 10. And um, we've dealt with this a couple of weeks ago. We talked about 2 Corinthians 2, 3 to 10. But here's Paul. We're, we're revisiting it in chapter 7 again. Would they, would they reject uh, Titus in their anger? Um, would they get angry and reject Paul's role as, as called to be their, a leader to them in Jesus? Um, thankfully, although there was sub a substantial weight in hearing of the news, Titus arrived with good news from Corinth. In fact, the Corinthian believers had received Paul's letter and it had cut them to the heart. It, it actually cut them to the heart. And they were sorrowful. A great sorrow came upon them. And uh, that sorrow was from the Lord. And Paul says, I, I, listen, I understand that what I wrote to you brought great sorrow. And, and, and it's not for that that I'm glad. It's not like he was glad that it brought him sorrow. What he was glad about was that it actually resolved the problem and brought them to, to a correct uh, heart. It, it had caused, it had brought them to repentance for what they had done. Um, and as an outcome, you know, uh, godly sorrow, godly sorrow always leads us to repentance. Always. When God is, 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 is causing us to be sorrowful in the spirit, it, it cuts us to the heart. And, and we're like those believers in the first, uh, the first sermon that Peter gave who were cut to the heart. Brothers, what then should we do? That's what the Holy Spirit does when he touches us. And, um, uh, you know, Paul's approach uh, had been right, although the delivery of the message was painful. And on this issue, a British evangelist from the turn of the 20th century, uh, his name's Campbell Morgan, he once said, No circumstances of personal affliction can dim the gladness of seeing souls grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul had a great deal of pain because of what he had to do. And the Corinthians had a great deal of pain because of what they had to do. Um, as a result of the short-term pain Paul had brought to the Corinthians with his words in his letter, the people's response had been right. They had humbled themselves before God and said, Lord, I'm so sorry. And, and the, there was healing that came as, as the rift was there, and there was a healing in that rift. Um, the dialogue that Paul write, writes here gives the right approach, the right attitude. If you want to bring about repentance in another person, the right tact was taken here by the Apostle Paul in the right attitude. Godly sorrow always brings repentance. Worldly sorrow, on the other hand, and the condemnation of the devil, <laughs> I call that, um, always brings destruction and death, always. It's interesting about this chapter that it's apparent that God uses different people and their spiritual giftings to bring about his purposes for collective spiritual growth. And in the case that we're reading about, God loved Paul, but God also loved Titus and God loved the Corinthian believers um, enough to work in and through them in partnership to bring about a resolution to their difficulties. 
God used Titus to bring comfort to Paul by being a peacemaker and a go-between the Corinthian church and, uh, and Paul. And, and in the humble response that, that the godly sorrow brought upon the Corinthians um, to Paul's rebuke, the Corinthians also encouraged Titus. And, and there was this healing and this unity because humbleness came and pride was put aside. And, and he says, Paul continues in verse 13, by all, by all this we are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we are especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. He's talking to the Corinthians. They refreshed Titus' spirit. I had boasted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. Paul knew that these Corinthian believers, although there was this rift, although there was this issue, that they loved the Lord and that they wanted, that he wanted them to, 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 uh, to be healed. He wanted them to, to, uh, to grow. Um, so. And, and his affection to you is all the greater when he remembers that you are all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. I'm glad, and I'm glad I have calm, have complete confidence in you. Sorry. I am glad I can have complete, complete confidence in you. So, where, is, uh, where am I going with all this? Okay, this is the punchline. Regarding the greater issue of the themes of this chapter that we see here, the lessons we can apply. We can apply lessons from the perspective of a person who is on the right side of an issue. There's issues that come. Sin brings issues, right? You have issues in your families. We have issues in our family. You have issues in church. You have issues in your employment. There's issues all over the place. They're, they're abundant. And we can apply lessons from the perspective of a person who is on the right side of an issue here because sometimes we are right and sometimes we are directed by God to say something to someone who is in the wrong. However, we need to be careful here. Being human, uh, we can apply lessons from this passage from the perspective of the person who is also on the wrong side of the issue, right? All of us are susceptible to being wrong from time to time and, and, and sometimes we need to heed the word of someone who has called us out in correction because God has directed that person or those people to correct us so that godly sorrow will be leading to repentance and a healing in the rift. If God reveals to us that we're called to say something to address an issue that's hurting someone or a group of people, like Paul did in addressing the Corinthians here, then we are right when we speak. It's not easy to stand up to say what is right. And we should expect that when we speak, that some will not like what we have to say. It will cause sorrow. But godly sorrow leads to repentance and prayer can change hearts in the end. God may be using us to help people just as he used Paul in helping the Corinthians. And any one of us can sit in this, in this position. Ray Stedman, the late author and pastor of Penasula Bible Church in California, um, he once said this, he says, you do not love somebody by not telling them the truth. We often let people go on and on and on because we say we love them too much to hurt them. But I do not know anything more self-deceptive than that statement. It is true that we do not want to hurt someone, but you do not know who that someone is. Is it us? Is it someone else? We don't want to hurt ourselves. We know that if we say these things to this individual, he's going to get angry at us or she's going to get angry at us and that's going to hurt us. And that's something we want to avoid because nobody likes the pain of that, right? Nobody does. This passage of scripture can also speak to us um, in a different way. You know, yeah, what I just said there, you know, we're kidding ourselves if uh, we say that love does not sometimes cause some pain. We're, we're kidding ourselves. When you love someone and tell them the truth in a loving, affirmative way, you enable them to see you really love them. And that's usually the message that comes through even though the person that's hearing you at the time might not realize that. 
but this passage also speaks about a lesson to us when we are in the wrong. And hey, how many people here can say I'm never in the wrong? Anyone say that? <laughs> the Bible says that if we say that, the truth is not in us, right? Because all of us are susceptible to doing what is wrong from time to time. And sometimes it's more than time to time. This passage of scripture speaks to us when we're in the wrong. There's times when as imperfect human beings, just as the Corinthians, we are susceptible to being led astray by something that is not true. It is not correct. And whenever someone accuses us of not being right, whenever someone tells us the truth about ourselves or about what we're thinking, it hurts. And it can produce two reactions. If we approach it from the worldly perspective, it will cause destruction and leads to death. But if it brings about what God, Paul calls, calls either godly grief or uh, godly sorrow, grief or sorrow is a, is a word for hurt here. We all feel hurt, but the question is, is the godly hurt that I'm feeling or is it worldly hurt that I'm feeling? There is a difference. As the apostle points out, godly grief stirs our spirit and we're faced with a choice. Humble yourselves before the hand of God, that he may lift you in, up in due time. Cast all of your anxieties upon him, for he cares for you. When we're in the wrong and we're hurt by being confronted by it, godly grief is the pain of suddenly becoming aware of something about ourselves that has been brought to light that's been hidden to our understanding up to that point. Maybe we didn't even realize it. And all of a sudden, God calls us out. That's something wrong about ourselves that uh, we haven't always been able to see creates a sense of anger and, and possibly defensiveness of injury and sometimes tears. It's the moment of self-awareness where we realize that we're imperfect and that we're sinners and that we're subject to being wrong sometimes. It's what you call that moment of truth. And um, I've had this happen. You've had this happen when you're just going along thinking everything's okay when someone comes and talks to us about something. And uh, even as it's being told us, it's like a stab in our heart. And our r initial reaction is to put up our dukes and guard, right? Defensive, defensive reaction. Um, and, and, and that's when the Holy Spirit goes, um, hold on a second here. Stop. Yep, you're defending yourself, but I'm actually speaking to you right now. So put down the dukes, buddy. Put down the dukes, Clint. Right? Stop. I'm trying to address something inside of you. Oh, Lord. I'm so sorry. I have that, I have that option. I can dig it. No, I'm not going to. That's not. I, I don't like it. It hurts. Well, God's like, you know what, son? Sometimes I need to hurt you to heal you. Okay. Have we ever thought about that? Sometimes God needs to hurt us to heal us. That's, that's the truth. Um, if it hurts, but it's godly hurt, it leads to repentance. It makes us change. We alter our behaviors. So we can find ourselves in both chairs, right? All of us here can find ourselves in both chairs. So whether we find ourselves at times in the right or in the wrong, God calls us to be humble and to be obedient and to work towards keeping unity with one another based upon what is revealed to us in the truth. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, and God has given us his joy and his word to guide us, because the truth will always be revealed through the word of God, not by our own thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So, today, may God bless you, may he strengthen you in your resolve, for the mission that he has called you to, your own personal Macedonia. Because God has given us everything we need, and he's given us a joy that is not going to fade no matter what we have to face on this journey. Amen? God bless you. Let us pray. Jesus, we just want to come before you. We, we recognize, God, that we're so imperfect, and we have so many issues that we face. And sometimes we're on the right side of an issue. Sometimes we're on the wrong side of an issue. 
Holy Spirit, we just pray that you'd help us to be humble, help us to be obedient, and have the right attitude. And, and uh, may everything that comes about be uh, done in the spirit of true love, whether that's um, calling something out or whether that's accepting responsibility for an error that we've made. Um, God, I just pray that you give us the strength for that. And God, I pray personally that you'd help me with this. And I pray corporately that you'd help each person out there with this. Some people out there have had horrible times in their lives. And um, maybe there's just been an unwillingness to work through stuff. And I just pray, God, that there'd be a breaking and healing that takes place inside of each person. God, we carry so much baggage from our, our nature sometimes. Lord, we just need to lay it down at your altar and sometimes repetitively, God, because we have this nasty habit of picking it back up again. So we lay it down before you, Lord. We ask, God, that you would be strength in us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.